Okay. Okay. Okay, folks, if you give me your attention, we'll get started. Uh, welcome to Cantini. We apologize that our auditorium isn't bigger. This is a problem we all want to have, but we, for those of you who got here after the seats were full, I'm, I'm really, really sorry. There's only so many chairs we can put in here because of fire codes, uh, and so we're just going to have to do the best we can. Uh, we are uh, rec video recording this, and it'll be on YouTube uh, shortly. Uh, and I know that's not much consolation uh, if you came here to hear the presentation, uh, but this will not be the only opportunity. Uh, so my name is Paul Herbert. I'm the director of the First Division Museum here at Cantini Park. I uh, want to welcome you to Cantini. If this is your first time here, and it probably isn't, but even if it is, uh, nevertheless, uh, Cantini is the historic home of the late Colonel Robert R. McCormick, longtime editor, owner, and publisher of the Chicago Tribune. Very, very wealthy and prominent Chicagoan and American. Uh, when he passed away in 1955, he left this estate as a public park for the people of Illinois. If you've come here from any other state, you're just as welcome as the Illinoisans. <laughs> Uh, second only to the Chicago Tribune in the Colonel's heart was the First Division of the U.S. Army, in which he served as a citizen soldier in World War I. And when he came home from the war, profoundly affected as so many veterans were, he uh, named this state Cantini uh, for a tiny little village 75 miles north of Paris in France, where America fought its first battle uh, of World War I, which was our first battle for Europe, and we're still in Europe and the security of Europe is still a question mark. Um, the colonel was devoted for the rest of his life to his fellow World War I veterans. He founded two American Legion posts, was the founder of the Society, the First Division, uh, and so his instructions uh, upon his death were, don't forget my beloved First Division. That's why there's a First Division museum on Cantini, and it's fortuitous for those of us in the museum business because the First Division has been on continuous active duty since 1917. Not a day has gone by that we haven't been served by the men and women of the 1st Infantry Division, the Big Red One. It is currently in Baghdad. It is the command and control headquarters for the military assistance effort that the President has directed to help our Iraqi friends confront ISIS. So it is a continuing history uh, that we're very proud to present. Uh, so tonight, uh, we're going to welcome to Cantini, and that's what Cantini is. Tonight, we're going to talk about the Battle of the Bulge. We have one distinguished professor and one guy that we just brought in to see if uh, uh, he knew anything. Uh, the distinguished professor is on my right, your left. Uh, this is Dave Ulbrich. Dave has a PhD from Temple University. He is assistant professor of history at Rogers State University in uh, Oklahoma. He has a long and distinguished academic uh, record in military history, including Ohio University, Ball State University. Uh, he's been a command historian for the U.S. Army Engineer School at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Uh, he's the author of two books uh, of significant uh, acclaim, uh, Preparing for Victory, a biography of General Thomas Holcomb and the United States and the making of uh, the modern U.S. Marine Corps, which won uh, the General Gibbons. General uh, Wallace. General Wallace, the General Wallace Prize for Distinguished Contribution to Marine Corps History in uh, uh, 2011. Uh, he and a co-author have just published Ways of War, which is a textbook on American military history. Uh, has been very well reviewed uh, across the country and was just recently selected by the U.S. Air Force Academy as their standard textbook uh, in U.S. military history. So we're delighted to have Dave, and he's going to talk to us in a few minutes. And D Dave, welcome very much. Thank you. Now, the guy we just dragged in here is me. <laughs> okay, I couldn't let Dave come in and talk about the Battle of the Bulge, uh, and particularly on the north shoulder of the Battle of the Bulge, uh, without at least spending a couple of minutes on the 1st Infantry Division, because uh, the 1st Division fought in the Battle of the Bulge in one of the most important uh, and little known, quite frankly, uh, fights uh, that, that brought that, uh, that battle uh, to a successful co conclusion for the United States and for our allies. And so I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about that, and then I'm going to hand off to Dave. Uh, and so 
uh, let's get started. Uh, this is when it happened, uh, from December 1944 the, uh, 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 until uh, the Allies uh, counterattacked in January 1945, a brutally cold and snowy winter uh, in that part uh, of Europe. Uh, the Ardennes forest on the border between Belgium and Germany. Uh, the Ardennes, uh, very famous, rugged land. We'll talk about that in a second. The Ardennes is where the Germans went through in 1940 when they successfully invaded France and, and uh, outflanked the Maginot Line. Um, U.S. Army, four divisions, several engineer combat uh, battalions totaling 70,000 soldiers. This depends on where and when in the battle you're talking about. By the time the battle ended, it of course had soaked up way more than four U.S. divisions and a number of British formations and so on and so forth. And the German army started with 25 divisions totaling about 200,000 soldiers and about 2,000 armored vehicles of one kind or another. So this is a really, really, really big battle. It's the largest battle in uh, the European theater of operations in World War II, largest land battle. And this is our typical image of it. This is a group of German soldiers that have uh, stopped and destroyed an American convoy. Uh, there's an American half-track on fire, and they're sort of... Uh, consolidating on that objective before they push uh, farther to the west. Uh, these German soldiers uh, have stopped for a second uh, to open the mail and smoke the cigarettes of the American casualties uh, that they've uh, uh, just recently inflicted probably in that same convoy. Uh, to bring you up to date, the 1st Infantry Division started, uh, it, it was again as it was in World War I, it was the first U.S. division we sent overseas in World War II in the European theater. We had two divisions already fighting in the Pacific, but the first division goes in August of 1942 to England and is deployed under British command to North Africa under Major General Terry Allen. They conduct an amphibious evasion at Iran, uh, fight across Algeria and Tunisia, uh, and uh, uh, when the Axis forces have been cleared out of North Africa, uh, they're recocked and they participate again in a second amphibious invasion in Sicily in 1942 and 1943. At that point, command is passed to this guy, Major General Clarence Hubner, who commands the division for about a year. Because the division has done two amphibious invasions in the Mediterranean, they're the most experienced amphibious unit in Europe, so they're brought back to England to get ready for the Normandy invasion, and they're the assault division on Omaha Beach on D-Day. Uh, on the Norman coast of France, and General Hubner is the commander. Uh, they then participate in the race across France and Belgium, but then the hard fighting in uh, the fall of 1944 along the German border. And in December of 1944, command is passed from General Hubner, who's promoted to Corps commander, to General Andrus, uh, who takes command on the 5th of December 1944, 11 days before the Battle of the Bulge begins. Uh, now, General Andrus, a very experienced uh, general, he had been commanding the division's artillery up until this point as a one-star uh, uh, one general, and he'll command it through the Battle of the Bulge and to VE Day, and then for the first several months of the occupation of Germany. Uh, this is the Western Front of World War II uh, at the time of the battle, uh, and it shows a couple of things. Uh, that most of France has been liberated, most of Belgium has been liberated. Uh, once the Allies fought successfully through the hedgerows and broke out of the beachheads, for a while they were racing across Europe, but it all bogged down in the fall along uh, the border of Germany, which is fortified, the Siegfried Line, uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one is they never opened a port, and so the supplies are all coming across the beaches at Normandy, and you can only get so much across, and there's more and more troops farther and farther away from those beaches, so it's harder and harder to move uh, petroleum and, and fuel and ammunition and repair parts and all the stuff you need to keep armies rolling. And, and so it's slowing down, and the German army recovers in their fortified west wall to catch their breath. The Brits make an argument that because of the supply uh, constraints, we ought to put all our eggs in one basket and hop across all these rivers, including the Rhine, to get on the North German plain and, and make a run for Berlin that way. And that's Operation Market Garden and a bridge too far that you've probably heard about, and it fails. 
And so then Eisenhower says, well, okay, we're, we're all going to go together then on a broad front, and it's going to be slow, uh, but they can't fight us everywhere, uh, and that's what they do. Uh, let's see what the... This is the Ardennes region. It's called the Eiffel on the German side of the border. Here's the Rhine River. Uh, this is part of Germany. Uh, and in Lux here's Luxembourg, Belgium, France. They all come together here. And, they, and on the uh, western side of the border, it's called the Ardennes. And this is where the Germans are going to concentrate uh, their, uh, their forces. Now, we have to remember that the Soviet Union is also at war. And in fact, by far and above, the bulk of the German army throughout the war is deployed on their eastern front fighting the Soviet Union. And the Soviets are coming closer and closer and closer to Germany. And so Hitler has to do something. He, you, you know, or these, these two sides are going to uh, crush Nazi Germany. And so his plan is a not surprise knockout blow in the West, split the Americans from the British, get a negotiated settlement in the West so he can turn all of his forces east and face the Soviet Union. So that's what he's going to try to do. Uh, and his objective is going to be Antwerp, uh, which we have captured, but we can't use as a port because we didn't capture the openings of the estuaries that lead uh, to the port itself, which is well inland. He's going to try and take that. And that's going to be his essential attack. He'll attack the American lines uh, right here uh, uh, from St. Vith uh, farther uh, north. He concentrates all those troops and tanks that we just talked about, uh, break through across the Meuse River, uh, which is right here, and get to Antwerp. Uh, the 101st Airborne Division will eventually, they aren't there right now, but they'll hold Bastogne. Everybody's heard of that name. The reason that town is so important, the reason all the towns are so important, is it's very rugged terrain. There's few roads that go through it. The roads all come together in towns. And so wherever those towns come together, there's a road junction. And if you're going to control movement back and forth through this area, you've got to control the towns. So that's why the towns are important. St. Vith is another one. 7th Armored Division will fight there. This is a blow-up of the same area that shows uh, the concentration of German forces in the Eiffel. And on the other side of that, it was very lightly defended. Because even though the Germans had used that very place in 1940 to come through with massive armor formations, outflank the Maginot Line, and overrun France in a matter of weeks, the Allies thought they wouldn't do it a second time. And we only put, because it was so rugged, we only put two divisions in there. One of them was the 28th Infantry Division, which had been beat up very badly in the fighting up to this point and needed a rest. And the other was the 106th Infantry Division, which had just arrived in country. And wherever we, whenever we could, we put those divisions in, in a quote-unquote quiet sector to sort of get their, uh, their feet on the ground uh, before they were uh, committed somewhere else. So you can see the concentration of uh, armored forces, 6th Panzer Army, 5th Panzer Army, and the 7th Army, which is not Panzer, and that's what the ground looks like. Uh, that's the U.S. 1st Army. Those two divisions would be along that blue line. There are the German formations I just pointed out. In the first 24 hours, they've got to get to and cross the Meuse River, okay? So they're going to get there as fast as they possibly can and throw bridges across it, uh, and then put a second echelon across those bridges that'll, that'll make the race for Antwerp. And they've identified through reconnaissance five routes. And there are the five routes generally. Now these are squiggly routes. I've, I've indicated them as straight arrows. But, uh, and they call them Rollbahn. Rollbahn is a German name. I'm probably not pronouncing it right. But from north to south, they're A, B, C, D, and E. But their plan is they got to have all five in order to get enough stuff all the way to the Meuse River in time to control the Meuse River, throw the bridges across, and pass the second echelon through, they've got to have all five routes. So the first phase is to break the American front and grab the entranceway to those five routes and then push armor down it as fast as you possibly can and, and clear everything out of the way uh, and get control of those five routes. Uh, that's absolutely critical to the German plan across the Meuse River and on to Antwerp. That, that's what they're going to do. And this is what the battlefield looks like uh, a couple days into the fight. Uh, they actually do attack all along there, and the attack is overwhelming. It nearly destroys the 28th and the 106th Infantry Division in a single day. In the first 24 hours of this fight, 
8,000 Americans are taken prisoner and whisked off to German uh, uh, POW camps. Uh, and and the, it is such a surprise and such a shock uh, that a lot of their formations make it quite a ways. Uh, and you can see here by Christmas, there are enemy forces just within a whisker of the Meuse River right there. And this is why we call it the Battle of the Bulge, is because it put this huge bulge in the Allied lines, and then the counterattack had to flatten that uh, out. Uh, there's Bastogne, the 101st Airborne Division was rushed there. They were surrounded, but they wouldn't give up. Uh, 7th Armor Division at St. Fifth, 1st Infantry Division up here on the northern shoulder at Buch a place called Buchenbach. That's the trace of the Meuse River. Those are those places. The 1st Division had been fighting in Aachen, the first German city to fall to the Allies taken by the 1st Division, and then in a very, very tough fight in the Her Herken Forest, just been pulled out of the line and sent to rest camps uh, near Liège, Belgium. And that was just about, it was like the 4th of December because the next day after they entered into those rest camps, they did the change of command between General Hugner and General Anders. And now what they were going to do is you're going to replace your walking wounded, you're going to get people who need significant medical treatment that haven't been evacuated for one reason or another, you get those guys out of there, you bring in replacements, clean weapons, get some rest, get some decent meals. Uh, that's what's supposed to go on for about two or three weeks uh, just to rest the 1st Division. The 1st Division has been in contact with the enemy, fighting every day since June 6th. Okay, This is December 4th, so well, there are like five months of continuous combat operations. They're a tired division. They're, they're beat up. There's no question about it. Uh, and, but, they're, but that's not going to happen because they get there on the 4th of December, the Germans attack on the 16th of December, and the division is told, all bets are off, everybody in the trucks, we're going back to the front, Let, let's go quick, uh, as quickly as you possibly can. And, uh, and so this is them arriving in the village of Buchenbach, that's the 26th Infantry. Some of them marched, some of them came on trucks, some of them came in jeeps by anything that would move. Uh, but there they are, and you can see the winter landscape there. Uh, these are the German forces that they'll face uh, on the northern shoulder, 12 of those divisions that we talked about, about 80,000 troops, and Dave is going to talk about Comp Group of Piper uh, in more detail. Uh, we're going to look at this map in the upper left-hand side. This is Elsenborn Ridge, which the Allies will hold. In that initial attack in the northernmost part, of the Battle of the Bulge, there are two U.S. divisions, the 99th and the 2nd, and they pull off one of the minor, no, it's not a minor, they pull off one of the miracles of combat operations in World War II. The 2nd Infantry Division has actually started to attack when the Germans attack it, and they attack the 99th Division, and the 2nd Division is ordered without any anticipation that this would happen to turn itself 180 degrees and not turn, discontinue your attack to the north, turn around, head south, and counterattack the Germans that are now south of you and into the and just in front of the 99th Division. Okay? That's almost an impossible maneuver. Uh, you know, I, I've tried to do stuff like that in peacetime in Germany with a battalion. And it, it's very, very, very difficult to do it with an entire division is just incredible. They do that. The 99th Division and the 2nd Division fight a, a, a horrific va battle of the Twin Villages. Uh, we aren't going to go into that, but make a long story short, they hold a key piece of terrain called the Elsenborn Ridge. And when they hold the Elsenborn Ridge, the two northernmost of those five routes are denied to the Germans. A and B. They've only got three left, C, D, and E. Over the next several days, the German attacks on the Elsenborn Ridge are horrific because they are desperate to break through and secure routes A and B, but they, don't, they, they are not successful. And so then they have a decision, since all five routes were critical, do we stop or do we, do we recock our forces and try and push everybody through on the remaining three routes? And that's the decision they make because the Fuhrer has told them that they absolutely must succeed. And so that's what they're going to do. And guess where Rolban C goes? Rolban C goes through the little village of Bullingen, which is right there, and then on to this little village of Buchenbach, and then on west in the area that Dave is going to talk about in just a minute. 
Roll bond D is just south of that. And so if you control this, you have some uh, ability to control roll bond D as well. This is what that area looks like. It's a topographic map. The village of Buchenbach is right there. Okay. The village of Bullingen is down here. Okay. The, uh, there's the Elsenborn Ridge. The 99th Division is holding that. Uh, there's Bullingen. It's in enemy hands. There's uh, Buchenbach. For the moment, it's in friendly hands. And this is Rollbahn C on the German maps. It goes right there like that. And the reason Buchenbach is important is that they can continue west from there, but they can also go north and cut the lines of communication supporting all these troops fighting on the Elsenborn Ridge. And they can also get to the U.S. supply depots around the edge. So holding this is absolutely critical. Uh, let's see. And this place is Dome Buchenbach. Dome or domain is a Belgian word. I'm not a linguist, but what it means is a is a big stone, it's a big stone farm. Okay. It's a farm estate. And it it's not fortified, but it's kind of like a fort. It's a huge manor house and a lot of outbuildings. It's been there since the 17th century, built of massive stone building blocks. Uh, the American commander, 2nd Battalion, 26th Infantry, uh, the 1st Infantry Division, decides, I'm going to make that my headquarters. When he arrives, that picture we saw a minute ago, troops are marching here on the north side of Buchenbach, and he's going to start heading this way to find out where the Germans are. And when he comes through here, he says, I'll put my headquarters here, and I'll organize my defense around this, but we've got we've to make contact with the enemy and see where they are. So that's what he's trying to do. And that's what that manor house looks like. That picture was taken in 1906, but it looked essentially like that uh, in, uh, during the battle. Uh, this is what the terrain looks like. Uh, 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 not quite mountainous, but big hills, lots of big hills, narrow little valleys, roads that twist and turn all over the place trying to get through them. And of course, it's a winterscape. Uh, about, on average, 20 degrees colder than it is right now today, and lots of snow on the ground. One of the coldest winters in a couple centuries of uh, European history. Uh, it's a modern photo, uh, but it gives you an idea. Uh, this is taken in the Ardennes. Uh, here's another one. And, uh, 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 and so this is what the ground looks like. And I love the juxtaposition of this picture with this picture. This is the 1st Infantry Division arriving in, the, in their defensive area around Dome Buschenbach. And you can tell, I mean, I don't know for sure, okay? There, you see, a, a, we don't know what that is, a half-track tank. There's a tank. These are GIs that are mar walking out into this field to find where the sergeant wants, to put it, wants them to put their foxhole. And I don't know for sure, but I think these guys are replacements. That guy looks like a replacement to me, okay? Brand new overcoat, rifle at sling arms, bundle of equipment that he just got a little while under his arm, you know, kind of a dazed look on his face. He looks pretty healthy. He doesn't look gaunt and worn like he's been fighting for six months, but he's got that expression on his face that, oh, Lord, what have I gotten into? What are we going to do? Uh, and God bless him because uh, they got themselves into a lot. Uh, this is what it's like putting guns into position under these conditions. This is an M3 57 millimeter anti tank gun. Uh, if we had the time, I would tell you a lot of stories about how these guns were used, uh, but they're towed by a half track, and in the mud and permafrost, semi-permafrost conditions, it's just harder than heck to muscle these things into position. The half track can only get it so close to where it needs to be, and then it's got to be manhandled. And so all these soldiers that are going to throw in these defenses, you can see how they're dressed, okay? This is heavy labor. Okay, they got to dig deep holes, they got to cut timbers, they've got to stockpile ammunition, they got to position weapons, they've got to do all this kind of stuff. And then when they stop, you, you've all been in this sort of situation, you're steaming with sweat, and of course it's about 10 degrees out, you know. Uh, so the 2nd Battalion will be the principal division or principal organization of the 1st Division, and it's not big. This, and there's a lot of funny abbreviations here but I've tried to translate them in the parenthetical expressions, and, and we don't have a whole lot of soldiers here. Uh, this comes out of our archives, and this is the actual plan. See, there's Buchenbach, there's Bulligan, there's Dome Buchenbach. 
The headquarters is going to be here. All the infantry is pushed way out in a perimeter that looks like this. This is mainly in woods, and they're dug in in foxholes. And then it's kind of like a big open space here. I'm sorry. And what Colonel Daniels, the commander, the battalion commander does, he's got a platoon of tanks from the 745th Tank Battalion, which was raised here in Chicago. Some of its veterans are still around here. Um, and the 634th Tank Destroyer Battalion, those are armored vehicles. So he says, you guys stay out in this kind of open area here, but button up. I'll have my headquarters in the basement of this, and we'll put all the infantry in a foxhole line like this, blocking these major roads that come in here. And then Colonel Daniels goes foxhole to foxhole, because a lot of these soldiers are brand new. And he says, look, dig as deep as you can possibly go. And when the fighting starts, don't get out of your hole. Stay there no matter what. I'm going to bring you timbers. I want you to put in overhead cover. I want you to camouflage it with snow. And when the enemy comes, kill their infantry. Don't take on their tanks. Let their tanks go by you. If you shoot at the tanks, the tanks are going to overrun you. They're going to shoot back. You're going to be dead. Okay? Don't, don't take on the tanks. Let the tanks go on. Kill the infantry. Strip the infantry, the dismounted foot soldiers, away from the armored vehicles so that the armored vehicles are more vulnerable. So we're going to let the armored vehicles go into this perimeter here, which is an open field. And then Daniel's plan is, worked out with General Andrus, is he's going to bring all the artillery in the world in on top of their own positions. And we're going to kill the Germans inside our own positions. And the tanks and the tank destroyers that are out here are in defilade positions where they can get good shots and contribute to that. And that's how we're going to stop them. So that's the plan. And all these young soldiers, like that guy whose picture we just saw, OK, sir, got it, all right? Uh, so that's what we're going to do. First SS Panzer Division probes them on 17 December, decides, wasn't expecting to find any Americans along Route Roban C in the neighborhood of Dome Buchenbach. They bounce off, go south to Roban D, and, and out of the picture. That was on December 17th. December 18th, they're attacked by the 12th SS Panzer Division, and they fend it off. On the 19th, they're attacked again by the 12th SS Panzer Division, this, this time coming from another direction and more spread out. They fend them off. 19th, the 12th SS Panzer Division strikes again. They're fought off. The 20th, they come with two divisions, the 12th SS Panzer Division and the 12th Volksgrenadier Division, more infantry. That is fought off. Finally, on the, 20, on the 21st, the Germans decide we're going to go way around. This nut is too hard to crack. We're going to go way around it and try to get into Buchenbach that way, and then we'll open up this route from the working west to east as opposed to east to west. This is a horrific fight, and you can see that by this time we've got another battalion of the 26th Division, and we've got some more forces that have been able to reinforce and extend that flank. And to make a long story short, that's fought off. So we're from the 17th to the 21st. This is four days of continuous onslaught by formations that outnumber this little battalion, probably 5 to 10, maybe 12 to 1, and with a lot of armor. Uh, our saving grace is a lot of artillery. This is what the battlefield looks like. This picture was taken from Colonel Daniel's headquarters. Somebody came up out of the ruined basement. That's a German tank that's been knocked out, and that is the American tank destroyer that knocked it out. So this is point blank. The German tanks are running around on the inside of the position, and this is point blank. If you saw Fury, everybody talks about Fury. There's some, there's some dramatic point blank tank battles in Fury. This is the real deal. Uh, I could tell you many, many more stories, but I want to get Dave up here, and, uh, and, and we, we will do that next. So that fight on the northern shoulder of the Battle of the Bulge denies to, is held by the 1st Infantry Division, the Big Red One. They take horrific casualties, but they hold that ground as they were told to do, and that shuts down Rolban C. And now out of the five routes that the Germans have to have, they have two remaining. Now, there's lots of leakers, lots of German troops bypassed it or got past, got through it somehow while all this is going on, and they're headed west. 
and nobody that is in this battle knows anything about what I've just said. All they know is that there's Germans all over the place and they're running wild and we got to stop them. Okay, so the first division after this point, the first division gets a little bit of a pause, but the battle continues along the northern shoulder like this. Okay, and that's the part of the battle that Dave is going to talk about. So that's the role of the Big Red One in the Battle of the Bulge. Dave. He's going to be a, he's going to be a hard act to follow. Uh, obviously, we know about Baston and the, uh, 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 the battling bastards of Baston who held off uh, Germans completely surrounding them. But I'm going to move back up north, as Paul said, and deal with what happens a little bit to the west of uh, where the 1st Infantry Division was. I want to talk a little bit about leadership here and the two leaders that, that commanded these two units I'll, exp I'll talk about. Uh, Paul's giving you a big picture kind of sweeping uh, perspective here. I'm going to get down very, very narrow into individuals and to small units. The two uh, units were commanded by battle-hardened veterans. Uh, I picked uh, the photograph of Lieutenant Colonel David Pergren on, on, the, on your left there because that is not an intimidating photograph. He's there with his glasses, at ease, with kind of a, you know, kind of a dumb grin on his face. And then I picked the most intimidating photograph I could find of a uh, uh, Waffen-SS Kampfgruppe leader, uh, 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 Joachim Piper. Now he was, the SS had a funny name for lieutenant colonel, but it's a lieutenant colonel, just a different name, you know, one of these long German names. Anyway, they were equally matched. Both of them had combat experience. Uh, Piper had fought on the Eastern Front and in France uh, during the earlier part of the war, and David Pergren had come on and joined the 291st Engineer Battalion while it was still stateside in April of 1943 and took over as commander of that battalion in August of 1943. So by the time we get to December, he's had the same unit and been with the same guys for a year and a half or more. That's very significant. David Pergren was a very courageous human being. At the very beginning of the Battle of the Bulge on December 16th, 17th, 18th, that sort of time frame, lots of Americans with good reason are running. They're being, they're being captured, they're being pushed off their line, but David Pergren makes the decision to stay, stand by his post, and disperse his uh, engineer soldiers to hold the towns and especially to hold the bridges across the many rivers. There's many rivers and creeks that, uh, that, that crisscross this region. And of course, you're talking about 70, uh, you're talking about 70 ton uh, tiger tanks, so you can't just cross any old bridge. And so they, uh, they, uh, they identified the key bridges and would hold them. And he gave them specific orders. This goes down to even sergeants. He tells his you know, lieutenants, uh, captains and sergeants, say, hold the bridge until the last moment and blow it only if necessary. Because he's thinking one step further. He's thinking that eventually the Americans are going to counterattack. So if they don't need to blow the bridge, they can use it coming, coming back. And of course, this is... This is a, uh, a hard fight by very, very small units as opposed to these uh, formations with thousands of men. All right, engineers, among the engineer skills, there's something called countermobility. That's keeping the enemy from going someplace. In this photograph, we see engineers that are wiring the trees for demolition to create an abatis, basically knock the trees down crisscross across a road. This won't stop the Germans permanently, but if you can slow them, if you can slow them down five or six or eight hours, that's good. Because remember, Piper's the tip of the spear, and he's on a timeline. They're also wiring the bridges for demolition. And this poor guy, and you can almost see him shivering, he's uh, laying an anti-vehicle landmine there in the uh, permafrost ground. So countermobility. In, uh, the engineers were uniquely qualified and uniquely equipped to stop heavy armor uh, from moving quickly through this region. There's a, uh, here's a topographical map. Um, there's where uh, Paul was talking about. Uh, then Piper runs further west, running, trying to get through 
across uh, the Ambliv River and other creeks to get over into this area where he could get to some open territory where his panzers would be, uh, his, his tanks would be most, uh, most devastating. The problem is these are all little one-lane one roads where the trees come right up for the roads. The, uh, uh, the tube on a tiger tank couldn't even rotate 360 degrees because, because the trees are so close in in some places. So in that case, you've got a, uh, a convoy, what amounts to a convoy, that stretches for several miles. His advantage in tanks becomes a disadvantage because if one or two soldiers with a couple of bazookas or an anti-tank gun can knock out the first tank, then the rest of them are going to be slowed down too. So uh, that's a complicated map. This is a, another map uh, that may be less complicated on some levels. You can see Piper's movement kind of zigzagging across. And I want to quickly talk about just four episodes, four incidents that uh, I think uh, embody what, what great work the engineers are able to accomplish in, uh, in this fight. Uh, the first one is at Malmedy. Now, of course, down here on, the, on December 17th, uh, down here just south of where this map is, you have the Malmedy Massacre, which that was a dumb move on every level because you've got hundreds or tens of thousands of American soldiers running scared. As soon as it gets around to everybody that the Germans are shooting prisoners, it doesn't matter how cold, how tired, or how scared those American soldiers are, they're going to turn and fight because every soldier wants to have a chance to choose what happens to him. He doesn't want to be shot in the back. So they're going to turn and fight. This uh, Malmedy village is a key crossroads because there are three major bridges that need to be taken by Piper. Piper comes up on Malmedy on December 17th. His uh, men uh, execute or uh, massacre the prisoners uh, down south here, and he decides that this uh, Malmedy village is too well protected. If you look, there's these little half moon things here, half moon uh, uh, features. Those are all roadblocks with uh, landmines laid across the road, barbed wire, machine guns, all sorts of things designed to slow down the enemy. Uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Pergren's uh, headquarters is here, and he basically has 160 degrees of protection with his roadblocks. This is what the engineers were good at. Piper gets here, decides it's not worth his time. He decides to move on to the next town. He doesn't want to get himself bogged down in a fight that's going to take hours, if not days. He's going to try to move on and hope he can catch another bridge uh, further along that he can uh, uh, capture. The next town he comes along to, little village, is Stavolo. And here we can see a photograph, and there's the bridge uh, across the river there, a uh, snow-covered bridge. That's what he wants, the bridge at Stavolo. Here's what happens. This is actually, uh, this is actually an example of how, uh, how, uh, how ingenious and how, uh, how really effective American soldiers could be when the chips are down. There's only about a dozen engineer soldiers that are going to hold this bridge. And here we have a tank column with 70 tanks coming in on them. They wire the bridge for demolition. Then they put a machine gun and bazooka here. They pick a, a curve around some high ground to set up their uh, roadblock with landmines. All right, so that's going to give them, uh, that, that will at least slow down the Germans. We've got one machine gun and one bazooka. They're taking on it. Then they send this corporal out of this private named Goldstein out to this little shack that's a couple hundred yards down the road. That's his outpost. And he hears the Germans coming in at night. And do you know what this, this private does, Goldstein? He steps out of the door and yells, halt. He's got his M1, a, M1 Grand, and he yells, halt. And of course, you can see the Germans, what's his das, what's his das, shoot him. And so they start shooting at him, and he, uh, he, he kind of runs over here, takes this little path, runs the way back, and he gets shot a couple of times, and he just about freezes to death. Finally, he does, he does survive. But uh, Piper thinks that there must be at least a uh, you know, company or maybe even a battalion defending this bridge because uh, they let loose with this machine gun, they let loose with their bazooka, and at night, I guess, the bazooka looked like it was something like a, some sort of anti-tank gun. And... Piper decides, I'm not going to try this. I'm going to move on yet to another bridge. So they don't even need to blow the bridge. 
This is the mighty German army. This is the, one of the outstanding German units. This is Waffen SS. This is one of the premier commanders, and he's not going to go for the jugular, uh, which I think says something which we can talk about later if you wish. All right, the next place they come to, it's getting up to December 18th uh, or so, uh, the night, uh, morning of December 18th. Uh, they come to uh, Trepont, three points. Trepont means three points. Three rivers or streams come together, and that's the key bridge. Well, by the 18th, soldiers have begun to stop and fight. And there is a couple of companies worth of soldiers, odds and ends, including soldiers of the 291st Engineer Combat Battalion, the 51st Engineer Combat Battalion, and other odds and ends of retreating soldiers that have decided to turn and fight. This really is a well-defended area. Uh, basically, the uh, Germans come in from the west, they fight their way as close as they can get to the bridge, and then the bridge is blown right under their nose. So basically, uh, um, Piper needs to go north to try yet another way to get, uh, to get across the uh, Ambliv River. <laughs> this takes time. This takes gasoline. And the other thing is, if he had gotten across that Ambliv River, around the corner, around the bend, somewhere over in this area, is a huge ammo and supply and gasoline uh, dump. He could have refueled all his tanks if he could have uh, captured the bridge intact. So we've gotten to, we started at, at uh, Malmody. We've gone to Stavelo. Now we're on to Trapant. Then he's going to go north because he has to. He's going to work his way down around to a little area, a little, not even village. It's just a cafe and a barn. Imagine that, a cafe in Belgium. Go figure. Uh, called Habemont. This little, it's, it's, there's the cafe, there's a pond, and there's some farmhouses and woods. And so he's coming down, down a rocky hill, and you can see him getting excited as he's looking through his, this is Piper, looking through his binoculars, and he's looking at, at this bridge, and it looks like it's intact. It's a good stone bridge that could support 70 tons times however many tanks he's got left. So he's getting closer and closer and closer. As he comes in, uh, you know, five, six, eight hundred yards, something along those lines, he begins to see movement on this side of the river. A bunch of little army engineers scampering around between trees and rocks to avoid getting shot. Now, he, he puts an 88 mil shell, uh, shell across their bow, so to speak, as a warning. But he's not going to shoot his 88s near the bridge. That would, might destroy the bridge. Then he starts uh, uh, pounding the, uh, the engineers with... Um, with small arms fire and with machine gun fire. Well, this kind of takes the engineers by surprise for a minute. But the engineers were there. They had wired the bridge for demolition. And it was supposed to be one of the sergeants that's going to push the plunger. And the sergeant isn't at the right place, so it comes down to a corporal. And I guess he's hiding behind a tree. He's looking for the officer, the sergeant. And he sees him, so he hits the plunger. He blows the bridge right in front of of uh, Piper, blows the bridge. Now he was, not, he was not fooling around. These engineers were not fooling around. They wired that bridge with 2,500 pounds of TNT. It was going to go. In fact, the explosion probably blew Piper's hat off his head for all I know. I mean, this would have been blown to smithereens. And eyewitness accounts said it was blown to smithereens. Piper was very, very angry, obviously, because they um, they blew his bridge. All he could do from, uh, from what one book says, all he could do was sit there and pound his knee and uh, curse the damned engineers, the damned engineers. And of course, if you know the, uh, the German, it's Verdampten uh, engineers. And Verdampt can be, can be translated damn, but it can also be translated a word that begins with F. And so he was very, very angry. But there was nothing he can do. This was the final bridge that stops Piper. Now, Piper's going to end up trying to find another way across another river going north and south. But essentially, by December 18th, only two days into the battle, maybe 48 hours or 60 hours in the battle, his spearhead was stopped, in this case, by combat engineers. And I take nothing away from the, <coughs> the, uh, 
the heroics uh, down at Bastogne and then you know the, the hundreds if not thousands of individual soldiers or small groups of soldiers that we'll never know about because they, 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 you know, they fought to the death in the middle of some forest in a, you know, in a snow-covered forest. But we do know about these engineers. And this unit was commanded by, a, uh, or this platoon that was holding this, uh, this bridge at Habermont was commanded by a lieutenant, name of Alvin Edelstein. Now there's something, I, I think, there, think God must have a sense of humor or a sense of irony, that a fellow by the name of Edelstein is going to stop the mighty Waffen SS, <laughs> the dude with the death's head on his, on his cap. I think, like I said, and then the other fellow, the one who stepped out with the M1 Garand, his name was Goldstein. So, you know, like I said, there's, there's something to that. These are small units, just a few soldiers. And this is what I think is so exceptional about Pergren and his unit. He had known these men for a year and a half. He had trained with them, and he had inspired confidence in him, or he inspired them to be confident in him, and he was confident in them. He knew he could give them the left and right limits of what his guidance were, and that they do the right thing. If he told them to hold the bridge to the last minute, they'd hold the bridge to the last minute, and then they'd blow it when they needed to. That is, um, I, I used to uh, teach, I used to give this briefing at the U.S. Army Engineer School to the lieutenants, especially the, new, the newly minted butter bar lieutenants. And I'd say, you know, this is what you need to do as a young officer and as you progress. You need to inspire confidence in your enlisted, and then you also need to learn to trust your enlisted. And of course, listen to your sergeants. Um, that's the best advice any lieutenant can ever get. All right. So, by December 26th, the day after Christmas, the uh, Allies, especially the American forces, are beginning to counterattack. This is a counterattack will take several weeks. I think it stops on uh, June 15th. Paul think it stops, thinks it stops, or uh, January 15th. Paul thinks it stop, top, stops January 26th. It's, it's, it, it, it's debatable when the Battle of the Bulge actually stops. But for the next two to three weeks, the um, Americans counterattack. Obviously, we have uh, George S. Patton uh, basically doing what Paul described with the uh, uh, Second Infantry Division up north. He takes three divisions out of the line, fighting on an east-west axis, axis, rotates them 90 degrees, and drives them 100 miles north in three days in a blizzard. That is probably uh, George S. Patton's greatest feat in uh, World War II. So he's able to begin to put pressure on the southern end of the bulge to relieve uh, Bastogne. But then, up north, the uh, 1st Infantry Division, the 82nd Airborne that goes in, other divisions that are there, 30th Infantry Division, the reinforcements that are streaming in to the north begin to drive south. These engineers, who had just laid landmines and set up uh, uh, roadblocks to stop the Germans, now must help to clear the path. So uh, there's where they were, Malmody. They're going to clear the path so the uh, American infantry, the U.S. Army infantry, can drive southward. And so each place you see these little dots are places where there were German landmines or where maybe they had been formerly American landmines. Here we have a soldier dealing with a booby trap, and this is another pair of soldier, engineer soldiers uh, doing mine detection. And of course, it wouldn't be easy. I mean, you've got a metal detector in a battlefield that people have traded back and forth two or three times in the last month. I don't know, it just a metal detection just seems to be problematic. It would have been very dangerous, but uh, again, the engineers not only can uh, uh, disrupt enemy movement, the engineers are also trained to uh, breach obstacles and breach landmines. And of course, this is one of my favorite photographs. That is route clearance. That is clearing the road. Here we have a, 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 a disabled German uh, uh, tracked vehicle, a, a self-propelled gun or some such thing. And there we have the ubiquitous uh, engineer bulldozer basically pushing it out of the way. And this photograph would have been taken after New Year's, is my best guess. So this is two weeks into the battle. And look, the snow's still falling. There's still all this uh, really, really uh, impossible weather uh, to deal with. Um, again, I, I'm a little bit biased because I, I kind of, uh, I guess you could say I got a little bit of a chip on my shoulder as I worked for the engineers as their historian. I had never served myself, 
but it was a humble experience, humbling experience to do the research and then try to uh, uh, teach this to engineer lieutenants, uh, warrant officers, and sergeants. Uh, and I, I definitely learned a lot more about uh, the fact that when someone back at headquarters gives an order, the tip of the spear, the grunts are going to have to execute that, and that's a, a very uh, a dangerous, uh, dangerous place to be. So I learned a lot more about the tactical level of warfare. So lessons or insights, or we want to take some questions, Paul, or do we want to introduce the veteran? A little of that. So that was terrific, Dave. Right. Thank you very much. Thanks. So now you've had two perspectives on what happens on the north shoulder of the Battle of the Bulge, and we'll sp spend a few minutes here uh, uh, answering questions. But before we do that, uh, one is if you have a question, we're going to pass mics. Is that correct? So please wait for the microphone because we are video recording this and you need a mic uh, so that everybody can hear. And also, I want to introduce this gentleman standing in front of me. Can you stand up, sir? There we are. Turn around. So this is Robert Sebi. And Dave and I weren't there. Robert was. He was a soldier from the 106th. Robert served in the 106th Infantry Division. He was uh, uh, at the front on December 16, 1944. Uh, he was in that division that was overrun by the Germans. He was one of the more fortunate soldiers uh, in a way and that he survived, if I understand the story correctly. Uh, but that was the good news. The bad news is he was hauled off to captivity in Germany until the end of the war. And uh, Robert, we're delighted to have you here. We thank you for your service. And uh, if you'd be willing to participate in the answer portion of the Q&A, we'd, we'd yeah, be, okay, good. Okay. Thank you. Good to have you here. And maybe we'll bring a chair over. Yeah. Would, you, would you like to join the stage and, and okay. ha have a seat right here? There you go. Okay, and on that note, uh, we'll take questions. I'd like to address the revisionist history that's all too common now. Uh, specifically, just the statement you can answer it. In 2007, Bill O'Reilly stated on December 16, 1944, an American artillery observation battalion captured an SS Panzer detachment and shot 83 Germans. This is the exact opposite of what happened. He later said he misspoke and meant Normandy. His latest creation is killing Patton. This is his uh, uh, latest uh, creation. How did Patton die? It was a result of a Russian instigated conspiracy, a plot, okay? And the auto accident was rigged to make it look like an accident. This is uh, outrageous revisionist history. And I went to Walmart the other day, and there's a stack of these uh, killing Patton books. I, I can't believe this stuff is actually being committed to print. Your thoughts, please. Dave, you're the history professor. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Paul. <laughs> Uh, you have a PhD too, you know. Um, I, you know, I, that's, there may be some evidence that he's been, or some so-called evidence that Bill O'Reilly or some of his minions have been able to find, but I don't take that sort of popular, popular, well, I don't even know if you call it a history. I don't, I, I think it's fluff and I would, uh, I'd really like to check his footnotes very, very carefully like see the actual documents and pull them from the boxes myself before I would believe that it was any kind of uh, conspiracy. Yeah, I, I, I'd have to concur. I haven't read the book. I, I don't know of his work. I don't pay a lot of attention to all of the, uh, as you say, revisionist history that, uh, that comes out. I try to do the best uh, that I can. On the, on the question of the, uh, of the atrocities, I think he does have it confused with Malmade, okay, which is a German execution of um, unarmed Americans who had surrendered. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, is all wars are terrible, and World War II was no exception. And as much as we owe to the veterans of World War II, there were excesses by American soldiers uh, in, both, in both theaters, uh, and I think it would be wrong to, uh, to deny that. I think that 
Uh, uh, I, I think that those are clearly the exception to the rule, and I think often because our army, like every other part of our government, serves uh, under the rule of law, I think the army tried uh, very hard to contain those things and to deal with them in a disciplinary way when they happened. Uh, that was not at all the case uh, on, the, on the other side. And, uh, uh, and there are numerous accounts of German atrocities all through the war from 1939 to 1944. So I think there's a fundamental difference. I'm gonna have to wait for the next person with a microphone. Question on, uh, start with uh, uh, Colonel Herbert. The, um, oh. how is the resupplies? These, the guys are in their foxholes and then they fight for days. Yeah. Um, did they just conserve their ammo that well or did we resupply them and how did we resupply them? And as soon as you're done, your counterpart, did the current, did the Lieutenant Colonel Fiverr lead the whole thing or didn't he have scouts out or anybody? Or he was the scout? Okay, so on the resupply question, for the most part, in that sector of the 2nd Battalion, 26th Infantry, they stockpiled ammunition in their positions uh, as heavily as they could and they stayed in their positions. There weren't many breaks in the fighting, but there were some. And when there was a break, they would get litter parties forward to evacuate the wounded, and they would get ammunition resupply uh, 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 parties forward. Also, just before the Battle of the Bulge, the U.S. Army was equipped with weasels. And weasels are a small tracked vehicle. They look exactly like a snowcat, okay? And as a matter of fact, you can still buy a modern version of a weasel, but they were developed by the Army, and they got one per battalion, and they were designed for resupply. But what they started using them for in the Battle of the Bulge was medical evacuation. And you can see pictures of, of soldiers, wounded soldiers on litters that are strapped uh, uh, across these weasels and, and being pulled out of the line. Uh, resupply was a nightmare. You know, it, it uh, thick, uh, uh, deep snow, cold weather, challenging conditions, under enemy fire, uh, uh, just really, really difficult. But that's what they did. Most of the supply of Airways uh, was uh, halted on account of uh, they they were grounded. They uh, we had only the supplies that we carried on our backs up to the front. To uh, to uh, to follow up a little bit, the engineers were also behind the lines helping to re repair roads and provide a avenues of, of resupply. That's another thing the engineers do. They help to sustain a little bit of a commercial there. Now to Piper, the question about why Piper didn't have scouts. I haven't, well, I think Piper was an egomaniac and he was, huber well, if, if he had hubris, I think, like many armor officers are, well, not many. <laughs> that, <laughs> like all those tankers. Like all those tankers. Anyway. Um, I think all he had to do was have a few scouts and then send in a company of men. They could have bypassed the you know 15 or 20 engineers at Stavelo or at um, or at at uh, Trapant or even at Havilland if he had just done a little bit of middle of the night sort of uh, reconnaissance and force. They probably could have secured one of those bridges. But I think that he was I think he was on a timeline. And I think he was probably, I, I, I said that in jest, but I think he was had a little bit too much faith in the fact that he did have uh, these Tiger tanks and other, uh, and, and other armored vehicles and that he should be able to just steamroll uh, the, uh, American, uh, uh, the American resistance. Yes, good evening. My... Uh, Dad was at the Bulge also, and he was with the uh, 22nd Infantry or the 4th Infantry Division. And from the letters and the information I've got, they did a lot of the work around St. Vith, St. Hubert, down through the Siegfried Line. And according to this, on September 11th, they were the first division to enter German soil. Is that Correct. I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't challenge that. The 4th Infantry Division in, in September, okay, which is well before the Battle of the Bulge, 
Uh, the Allies are approaching the German border. I don't know it, uh, exactly who is first to cross the German border. It could have easily been the 4th Infantry Division. The, the, the border there takes a very sort of uh, circuitous uh, 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 route from north to south, uh, and there were a lot of American units approaching it uh, uh, at the same time. I personally don't know who was first into Germany. The 4th Division certainly did play a significant right. role in the Battle of the Bulge. Right. He originally uh, was in the 12th Army before it was removed. So were, was the 12th Army in the area now? I, I personally don't know. Yep. Uh, eventually there would have been probably 40, Amer 40 or maybe even 50 American or Allied divisions involved. Eventually there are about 750,000 American soldiers that are converging from all directions. So a lot of divisions were were involved and they all certainly deserve credit. Oh, are we going here? For their bravery. Okay, yeah. I, thank you. Um, one of the points that, uh, that you both made, uh, or at least uh, you, Colonel, in particular, was that <coughs> this was a, um, a surprise to the Americans. The bulge was a surprise to the Americans, even though it obviously involved massing of uh, large amounts of troops and uh, thousands of armored vehicles. Um, would you comment on why Allied intelligence failed to perceive beforehand the fact that the Germans were preparing this stroke? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, and let's pass that back here. And I'm going to try and use the microphone on this side. I'll go to this gentleman uh, next, and we'll try to cover both sides. It, it was a massive intelligence failure. And there's been books written about that. Uh, we had almost all uh, of the information that we needed to anticipate that there would be a major uh, German attack uh, in, the, um, uh, uh, in the Ardennes region at about the time that it actually happened. Uh, you know, Dave used the, the term uh, hubris uh, uh, a little while ago, and I, I'd have to say that's not too extreme. When, when the Allies broke out, of the Normandy beachheads. They raced across uh, France and Belgium, and they had the German army on the run, particularly after a big chunk of it was destroyed at the Pelée Gap. There was, there was a mindset that the war is going to be over by Christmas. Uh, that's why they, they bet the farm on Operation Market Garden. It was risky, but it looked like you could pull it off. Okay. And even though they were running into stiffer and stiffer German resistance as they got up against the, uh, the wall uh, at the west border of Germany, there was still this mindset that we've, we've hit them hard, we're on our way to Berlin, this is almost over, one more big push as soon as we get resupplied. And then you add that to the, 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 their analysis of the Ardennes as a region that the Germans could not go through with heavy armored formations because of the nature of the terrain. We just blew it. We missed it. They were there, and they came, and they tried. Uh, it's, it's one of the significant Allied intelligence failures of World War II. Uh, I think we're going to go to this gentleman next, and then we'll take one from the other side. Yes, we, we hear an awful lot about General Patton and his role and his personality, but there was another general who went from being a private to a four-star general. His name was Courtney Hodges. I wonder if you could uh, talk about him a little bit and compare him to, to Patton. I served under You served under him? Then we got the right man. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about General Hodges, sir. <laughs> well, uh, I, I never met the man. Uh, uh, all I know is he was, he was our general. He was, uh, uh, I think, in command of the First Army. Right. And that's, that's about all I can tell you. Yep. And comparing someone to General Patton is going to be awfully hard because <laughs> he was a unique personality. I think that, I think that um, Hodges was um, probably at the wrong place at the wrong time as, as a senior leader. Uh, that's part of it. Um, I, I'm scanning my random access memory in my brain to try to think if I can say more. But again, um, 
I don't know. Paul, can you help me out? <laughs> um, uh, not a lot, but because I think I, I think you're correct. I think a comparison to Patton of any other American general, and and it's kind of an apples and orange comparison. But one of uh, uh, Hodge's reputation is is uh, uh, a guy who's very detail oriented and and very organized and methodical in the way that he that that he thought about deploying his army. He he's not. You know, we didn't promote fools into commands of armies. So every one of these generals that, that makes it to Corps Command or Army Command, particularly late in the war, it's a meritocracy. You know, we can all be cynical about, about political relationships and all that, but, but this is a big war. Lots of people are dying. Serious issues are at stake. And for, for the most part, like General Huebner, who's promoted from, from Division Command to Corps Command, these are pretty tough generals who have proven themselves in earlier campaigns and are selected by Eisenhower personally with the approval of General Marshall, the Chief of Staff of the Army, and oftentimes the President of the United States himself uh, for the positions that they hold. So, you know, it's real easy to look back on them and say, oh, what a fool or oh, what an idiot or oh, what a, you know, I would have been so much better. Uh, these are pretty smart guys. Now, having said that, Hodge's reputation is more of a by-the-book guy not so much of a risk taker, uh, very concerned about organization, discipline, everything in its place, dotted I's, cross T's. General Patton is also a tremendous disciplinarian. You know, a lot of people say, oh, I'd love to work for Patton because he's such a swashbuckler. Okay, well, be careful what you ask for. You might get it, okay? And, and he did not brook a fool. But General Patton's mentality is twofold. And here's an interesting thing about World War II veterans, and, and maybe Mr. Sebi can, can, can confirm this, but in the ones that I've dealt with in the museum over the last 10 years, okay, the ones who came anywhere near General Patton want to tell you about it, okay? They'll say, I served with Patton, or I met Patton, or Patton this, Patton that, Patton the other thing, but they all, if they had anything to do with General Patton, they tell you about that, alone among the Army commanders. There, there's not a single other Army commander that I've ever heard a veteran initiate a conversation with about and say, I served with, you know, name your general. And so Patton had that, that magic of having this flair, this powerful image that he cultivated very, de very deliberately. And then he built it into his army, but he built it into his army with very detailed staff procedures and, and good instincts about warfare and ironclad discipline uh, among his soldiers. So when he tells General Bradley and General Eisenhower three or four days before the attack on the counterattack into Bastogne, he says, I can have three divisions on the way in 24 hours. Okay, and everybody looked at him like, are you mad? Well, no, he constantly had his staff working out not only the current fight that we're in, but what if we have to go this way? What do we do? What if we have to go that way? What do we do? And so he had these, he had a, a well-oiled machine that responded like that. Very, very interesting. Yeah. I just wanted to mention, uh, I know very little about General Hodges. I, I think he was a good man, mm -hmm. knew what he was doing, but uh, a PFC in M Company of the 422nd Infantry doesn't really know that much about what's going on. But the more sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well said. <laughs> Following orders. Okay, let's take one from over on this side. And let me use that to pass right before. Yes, Mr. Sebi, I. Uh, Congratulate you for going through what you did as a, a prisoner of war. Uh, my father was also a prisoner of war. He was captured in Bulligan. Uh, he was at the point of the road at uh, First SS Division, actually. He uh, was captured by the men there. Uh, he went to Stamlager 13C in Hamelburg. Where did you happen to go? Stamlager 4B. Oh, 4B. Oh, oh. It was, well, here, we were here, hang on. Here. Here. Uh, here we go, sir. We walked over uh, the eastern half of Germany. Okay. It seemed like, anyhow. And uh, on Christmas Day in 1944, am I right there? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah 1944. Uh, 
we were uh, locked in boxcars on a siding somewhere in Germany. And uh, some of our fighter pilots were, uh, they were still overloaded with ammunition on their way back from, from uh, uh, flying with a, with a bomber group. And uh, they decided to get rid of some of their ammunition. <coughs> Could see those bullets coming through the side of the boxcar. My father had some of the same uh, uh, type experiences, yes. Yeah, he was fortunate. He, he was uh, at Hamelburg, and they asked them to uh, work outside of the camp as laborers, so he was sent to Würzburg. And uh, that's where he was uh, when the English firebombed the city, and he managed with four other men to escape. It was Easter Sunday, 1945, and he made it back to the Allies, the 42nd Division. But again, I applaud you for going through. I know that my dad went through a whole heck of a lot, so I know you went through the same thing. Yeah. You got these cards you got. Yeah. Let's ask Mr. Sibby when he was liberated. Uh, when were you liberated, sir? Uh, well, uh, I, I, don't, I can't give you an, an exact date, but uh, our guards, we were in the town of Leipzig at the time. We were working on uh, trying to repair damage that had done, been done the night before by our bombers on the railroad uh, station there. And uh, about the middle of May, I think it was, or uh, probably before the middle of May. Mm -hmm. uh, All right. Yep. Somewhere between okay. the first. Mr. Thank Sebi, you. I don't have a specific question, but I wonder if you could tell us what uh, are some of the one or two or three of more significant recollections you have of your time in the military. Well, this has been over, well, between 65 and 70 years ago, you know. My memory never was great, <laughs> and uh, I can't really tell you too much about the, the main thing I remember about being a POW was starvation. We would have given our eye teeth for something to eat, which was not entirely their fault. I mean, they couldn't feed themselves at that time. But we all suffered on account of that. Okay. Uh, let's take, uh, let's see. Okay, there's a question here. Kurt Vonnegut was on the same train that you uh, you were on. He was in the 106th uh, Infantry Division, and he wrote when the American planes, I guess they were, he said they were British typhoons that strafed, strafed the train, and the uh, car that got hit the worst contained the officers. Do you know anything about that? Thank you. Thank okay. you for your service. John. Yeah, getting back to your, your position as a POW, when you were first captured, what were the circumstances that led to that? How then did you feel? Because you knew that you were going to be taken out of combat. Well, you know, it's like a catch-22, you know. They kept telling us uh, about the infiltration of uh, German soldiers in white uniforms. Mm -hmm infiltrating all around us, but it was just hard to believe. I mean, we were Americans. People just didn't attack Americans. <laughs> uh, we were invincible. Yeah. I didn't believe it till it happened. And I wonder how the Germans r would treat you when they knew, they all knew that the war was coming to an end. Were they? They were didn't the guards, realize that. They didn't. They didn't uh, realize okay, they so were. They, that they carried on the just end. as if. Uh, they were going to win the war. That's right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. One of the things that we read about the battle is how American soldiers weren't properly equipped. 
uh, many of them not having winter uniforms. I was just curious as to what, sir, you, you know of that or the historians. We were properly equipped, but the trouble was the, with the way the, uh, the weather was, and we had just moved up online, and uh, they couldn't fly in supplies to us. We were short on ammunition, food, whatever. The only thing we had was what we carried up there with us. Now we hear a lot about the uh, superiority of the German armor especially the tiger tanks. How do you, how were the uh, tanks repelled at the beginning when they came up against uh, infantry that's just simply dug in? Well, uh, some of our uh, tank destroyers, the motorized tank destroyers did a good job. I mean, when they hit a tank, it was done. Do you want to comment on that, Dave? Yeah, and, and I think the other thing that occurs in terms of the tanks is you, uh, you let the tanks go by and then the Americans would, you know, take out the, uh, the, the German infantry, but the tanks could be uh, destroyed or disabled b by landmines. And we're talking these little narrow roads, if, as I said, you get the uh, tank, the first tank, it's going to gum up the rest of the convoy. The Germans didn't even take really bridging equipment with them because they knew that that was a liability. Where do you put the bridging equipment? The first, the second, 10, 10 vehicles back. And so they were trying to rely on such speed that it was just, just a matter of figuring out a way to disable the tank with a mine or a bazooka or some other uh, artillery. Yeah, in the, and in the case of the second battalion uh, of the 26th Infantry, they told, they, they told their infantry, don't take on the armored vehicles. Uh, stay in your holes, go to ground, kill as many infantry as you can, and let the armored vehicles uh, go past you. Now, oftentimes, the infantry would uh, organize hunter-killer teams, uh, a couple of guys with bazookas, maybe a machine gun, a couple riflemen, and they'd go out into the, uh, into the woods where these circuitous trails were, and they'd try and get a lucky shot uh, at a German tank, or they'd try and sneak up on them when they're refueling or doing something like that. Uh, so that sort of thing could be done. They weren't helpless, but but infantry s standing toe to toe against German tanks uh, really wasn't something you wanted to do. You wanted to do exactly what Mr. Sevy uh, said: uh, is is hold their infantry off and wait for our tanks, our aircraft, our artillery, and our tank destroyers uh, to take on the enemy armor. One of the strengths of the American Army by 1944 is. Uh, is combined arms. The, the ability to put all of what I just said together, including engineers, in, 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 in pretty rapid order and use it all together, okay? And that, that was an American strength. Uh, yeah, let's go the to the, the woman in the back here, and then uh, JD will take one from over on your side. Well, the Germans were trying this rapid advance on these five avenues. Didn't they have their own supply problems with fuel, um, you know, trying to go forward the way they were? Dave, you want to? Absolutely, absolutely. They had, they didn't have enough fuel to get where they needed to go. They had, you know, let's just say half the fuel they needed, so they were, they were intending to capture American fuel depots and resupply along the way. Uh, they simply didn't have enough gasoline. Uh, the, uh, the King Tiger II guzzles gas, to say the very least. It has maybe a 150-mile 150 uh, uh, combat radius at most, maybe only, maybe only 100 miles. So it's really not, it's not, a very, uh, it, it, it's not, not going to last very long if they don't get uh, their, their gas refilled. Let's take somebody over from this side, and we'll take one more after that, and then I think we're going to be close to done. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Dave, yeah. I'd be very Don't curious about this. No. <laughs> um, with uh, these, uh, this research and the study of history and so forth that you've done, this is fascinating, and, and uh, you can build mountains of, uh, of, of knowledge based on that, very useful to know and pass on. I'm curious also, though, how you, you know, juxtapose or compare what, uh, what you're doing now to teach 
um, young uh, officers and, and sergeants and uh, your comrades, you know, who you're teaching now about uh, modern day warfare and how it might be utilized. I'd like to know if what comparisons, what differences, what similarities you could uh, comment on. All right, well, uh, first of all, to clarify, I'm now teaching at a civilian school, so I'm teaching uh, mostly 18 to 22 year olds, but then for about four years I taught um, uh, engineer uh, lieutenants, uh, warrant officers, and senior NCOs. I, it's, when I teach current events, I am much more careful and uh, I'm not gonna spout off like I did with my comment about armor officers. I'm, I'm, more, I'm more careful and then I'm mindful of the fact that if I'm especially teaching warrant officers or NCOs, if I say something about anything going on in Iraq or Afghanistan, someone was there or near there, and I'm very, I'm very respectful of their opinions, but I don't, I, I don't want to pitch something out there that then they're going to challenge me, and it'll become about me challenge, them challenging me and me trying to react. So I'm more tentative. I try to lay out some ideas, and then unless it's a packed house like this, I would try to get discussion because if someone says, well, I was there, well, tell us about it. So I, I tried to get them to talk themselves. Rather than me lecturing, I would try to get the soldiers or the officers to talk themselves and uh, talk about it themselves and then generate a conversation. It's a, a, whole different, it's a whole different matter looking back 70 years where I can play the, the armchair general, the Monday morning quarterback. And if I'm talking 10, 15, in the last 10 or 15 years, someone's been there and done that. And I haven't, and I'm acutely aware that when I'm talking with a soldier, I can talk with them like this, but if another soldier comes in, they may talk, be talking two feet away from me, but because I'm not a soldier and I haven't been there, I might as well be 10 miles away. So I try to treat, treat it with respect. Okay, we'll take uh, another question here. So I spent three years, 29 months in Germany is, um, where, where the Battle of the Bulge was and where they went through, did they have to go through like Karlsruhe and the Black Forest? Was, was that is that close to the area that that uh, yeah, where this took Ardennes. took place? That would be the Ardennes Forest and the Black Forest. It was in that area, yeah. In that area, uh, yeah, because. I don't think I quite I heard. heard. He, 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 had, um, he said that he had uh, been to that area and it's quite rugged. He verified oh, that yeah. he said that it was very, quite rugged very terrain. Rugged area. Yeah. So. Okay, so um, thank you for the questions. Uh, okay. It's very warm and it grows late, so we'll cut it off here. But all, all three of us will stay here if you have other questions. We have a special display over at the First Division Museum. Uh, we've done four vignettes of the Battle of the Bulge, uh, Buchenbach, St. Vith, and Bastogne in Legos. <laughs> and yes, we have, and we want you to come see them. And I, I want to tell you that I had a little trouble taking something as serious as the Battle of the Bulge and what American soldiers like Mr. Sebi went through there and reducing it to Legos. But it's pretty cool, and young people love it and they're taking pictures and they're asking questions and they're reading the interpretive information that we've got around it. And it, it, it's really pretty interesting, so I commend it to you. Uh, and uh, I appreciate your coming here uh, very much. Uh, we're closed in the month of January, so we won't be doing another one of these events until March, I believe, is that correct? Uh, but uh, stay tuned on our website uh, or sign up on our mailing list and we'll let you know what the 2015 uh, uh, schedule is going to be. I greatly appreciate everybody being here. Uh, I want to thank uh, Robert Sebi for his service and Dr. Dave Ulbrich for a wonderful presentation. Thank you for coming. <laughs>
Randolph, don't take charge. We missed it. We'll do it after everybody's left.